I suppose it was a mixture of my background and things that are attractive to me, but um, I grew up in West Africa and I had lived a life among the Kweta people in Bong County, Liberia, and I was looking around for what I might do when I left college, and I thought, this is really something that fits what I would like to do because it brings aspects of culture, ethnography, music all together in a way that I just couldn't have anticipated before. So I thought, this is really the area I want to study. I started my graduate schooling at Hunter College in New York City. At the time, my husband and I were living there, and I saw an ad in the newspaper for a course in ethnomusicology at Hunter College, and it was offered in the evenings, and so I started taking that class, and from there, continued on to get a master's degree there, and that was the beginning of my study. It was primarily with Rose Brandell, who was very much of um, what we might call an armchair ethnomusicologist. She had never been to Africa to do field work where she did her analysis. She was a student of Kurt Sox, the musicologist, very much from a musicological point of view. And it was really there that I began my work. And then I heard about this program at Indiana University and I made a point to go to an SEM meeting. It was in uh, North Carolina and it was there that I met Alan Merriam for the first time and George List and I saw Charles Seeger. He was still alive attending the meeting and so I decided that I would apply to go to school at Indiana University and of course my education at Indiana was much more multicultural, interdisciplinary, uh, anthropology, folklore, uh, linguistics, all of these areas including language study in Bambara, a West African trade language. So it was a rich opportunity for me to combine studies from multiple disciplines and so very different from my master's work, but gave me another viewpoint on the discipline for sure. I started out for my own dissertation looking at music as event, and I drew from the area of phenomenology. I had taken a course with Professor Judith Hansen in the anthropology department at Indiana, and that approach really resonated with me. Uh, she also worked in the area of symbolic interactionism and I found that that really fit with what I was interested in and my project focused on issues of cueing and uh, how musicians communicated with one another in performance and this really dealt with issues of time and temporality and from there I then continued on with uh, in my second book to look at aspects of all timing and how people understood time in epic performance and that was interesting because it involved a much broader event and text was very important and uh, multiple performers and uh, people who were theatrically uh, performing as well as uh, telling a story and not just musicians performing on a drum or singing. So that was a continuation of that project and I worked on that after my dissertation for my second book. And then I branched off, did some work on theory. Um, the first book I wrote on theory and ethnomusicology today and that book really grew out of the class we have here in Paradigms in Ethnomusicology. I had taken the course as an undergraduate and it was really focused on linguistic paradigms but when I began to teach it I explored a whole range of theories and paradigms that were being used in the field. And then from having taught that 
class for a number of years, I wrote the first edition of the book. And that was a interesting project and quite different from my ethnographic books that I had done. Then when the Civil War broke out in Liberia in the late 1980s, I was not able to go there for about 17 years. I didn't go back there, but my husband was working in the Middle East and I did research on expatriate music making, looking at how Westerners, Americans and British drew on music to create notions of home for themselves. And I published a couple of articles on that. And uh, so that was an, another turn that I took. I also looked at African influences in Arabian music in this area. And that was fascinating to me to see the African influences on local Arabic music. And I've published uh, several things on that. But so my research has always been anchored in Liberia, West Africa, and that's where I've returned most recently to look at uh, music during the Ebola crisis. And so then I branched off into considering how issues of trauma, medical uh, issues impact performance. And this related as well to some work I did on the effects of war on music in this area. So I've returned back to the same field site, but the topics have sort of evolved over the course of the years that I've done research. So a variety of topics, but always at the central core, phenomenology, interest in time, interest in temporality. Well, my career has involved more than just my own research, for sure. I've had a lot of students that I've worked with on PhD dissertations, more than 60, almost 70, I believe, uh, MAs and PhDs. So I've really benefited from learning about these topics and students who've come from all over the world to study here. And that's been really rich and I've benefited so much from learning and engaging with them on their projects. So teaching in the terms of dissertations, teaching classes, teaching core courses like field work, uh, like the theory course, courses on West African music, uh, courses on issues of time, seminars, African studies seminars. So that's been really some of the most satisfying parts of my career. But beyond that, I also got into administration on a number of levels. I was first the director of the Archives of Traditional Music for a number of years and learned a lot about all of the issues of preservation, access, and ethics in regards to keeping these collections. And then after, I think it was about seven years, I went and became the um, chair of the department. And I've been chair of the department twice uh, for several years each time. And once having stepped down from all of that, I was asked to be the Associate Vice Provost for Research. And that was an exciting time because I was asked to also begin the Institute for Digital Arts and Humanities. And this was a totally new area for me. So in 2006, I believe, we started that. And I worked with that, but in the course of my administrative work there, I worked a lot with faculty, helping them find grants, helping them improve what they were writing for applications, traveling to Washington, traveling to other parts of the world to set up arrangements and uh, cooperative agreements. So it's been a combination of teaching, research, and administrative work. I've also worked as president of the Society for Ethnomusicology and president of the Liberian Studies Association, so that has also involved a different kind of networking and working with people. I just feel really lucky to have discovered ethnomusicology. 
I think uh, we don't always find a place to spend our lives that is so rewarding and for me it's really been exciting and I continue to work in this area even though I'm not teaching at the moment uh, there's still a lot to be done I have lots of notes I still have contact with lots of people work with a few students and so it's just great when you can have a rewarding area to spend your life and going to work isn't a chore it's really a joy and so that's really I've been so lucky and it's taken me so many places in the world so many uh, continents countries uh, it's really been neat oh wow that's a big question um, I think it's really important because music performance sound are such kind of visceral areas of human human performance human activity and I think it's often in this nexus of activity that people reveal so much of themselves and I think there's a lot we can learn I remember during the Ebola crisis how people said that music was the one thing that help them stay together. They couldn't touch each other, they couldn't be close to each other, but sound wasn't contagious and they were able to use it and perform. They were also able to use humor in music to help warn people about the disease. So I would say in times of war, in times of epidemics, and just in ordinary times, Music is just such an important part of lives everywhere. And the more we can do to kind of illuminate what's going on there and help people understand the importance, the I think better off the world would be.